Mystery woman was killed over 40 years ago. Police now know her identity and are hunting her killer. A 23 year old woman who was killed has now been identified and her killer is still out there. 40 years after her remains were discovered in Nashville, the mystery woman has been identified as Michelle Inman. She was identified through genetic genealogy. A skeletal remains were discovered by a driver who was having trouble with their car. They pulled over back in March 1985 and discovered her body. It was determined that she was killed around two to five months before her body was found. Investigators were actually able to find her brother through the new information, but he said that he hadn't been in contact with her for over 40 years. This is quite obvious because it's been over 40 years since she died. We still have no idea who is responsible for her death. So basically what this is, is a, a real life audio of La Llorona. So this is straight from the Pueblo, bro. No CGI, no fake shit. This shit is literally our boy's uncle, bro. What the fuck with all this shit in the back? His houses and stuff, bro. He's just outside, like, walking. You believe in the Yorona? Yeah, bro. I'm pretty sure we talked about the legend before. It's, oh, there's different ways of interpreting the story. I know a lot of people have different ways of talking about it. But from what I heard is that there was this lady who fell in love with some guy. He had kids with her, but the guy didn't love her back. He ended up cheating on her and stuff. Left her with the kids, and she ended up taking out all her anger on the kids. Drowned them, and then she ended up regretting it. And now she's cursed forever to roam earth with the whole guilt of her killing her kids so if you hear a cry at night outside bro yeah not to go the fuck inside regardless if it's paranormal or not just hearing a cry at night i'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna fucking dip. in 2023 this is the last photo taken of eric hutchinson and samantha miller before entering their vehicles and being struck by a drunk driver the drunk driver was jamie komorowski the bride was killed instantly and the husband was rushed to the hospital and he survived his injuries Komorowski was charged with three counts of felony DUI and one count of reckless homicide. The husband went on to file a wrongful death lawsuit against Komorowski and the establishments that overserved her alcohol that night. Two of these bars paid Hutchinson out a reasonable amount. However, the case continues with the other defendants. Now, things took a weirder twist here. Lisa Miller, Samantha Miller's mother, said that she was entitled to all the money Hutchinson was getting. She questioned the legality of the marriage and said she deserves all that money because she is the last remaining person in her daughter's estate. This led to a legal battle between Hutchinson and Lisa Miller. Even though he already agreed to pay half of what he was receiving, she wanted all of it. It was a tragic but also weird story. There's so many plots to this. Let me know what you guys think about this in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. Okay, so we all know Aaron Hernandez, the titan for the Patriots who committed murder. Well, his brother just got arrested because he was planning on committing a school shooting. This is Dennis DJ Hernandez, the older brother of Aaron Hernandez. And he has been arrested because there is a concern that he had been planning a school shooting at UConn and Brown University. The disturbing allegations are all spelled out in new Bristol Police Department documents, where cops say Dennis Hernandez showed signs this month of being gravely disabled and a danger to society. Several people came forward in early July claiming that Dennis had been acting erratical and sending alarming text messages including one that allegedly read, We're taking lives if this blank isn't paid. It's been years in planning just taking notes, names, and locations. They talked their way into this and it's almost point game. So yeah, what is going on with the Hernandez family? Aaron Hernandez gets charged with murder and then commits suicide in prison, and now his brother Dennis is being charged with trying to shoot up a school. This is just crazy and I guess it just runs in the family. This real life bad Santa was charged with groping a teenage elf. This is 62 year old Herbert Jones and in 2013 he was playing Santa in a local mall in Massachusetts. Now, I've always thought that mall Santas are creepy, kids just come up and sit on these random man's laps, but Herbert took this to a whole new level. Apparently, while he was on shift in Santa garb, Herbert pinched an 18-year-old girl's butt who was working as an elf. He then allegedly told her that he wished she was younger, which is a very creepy, disturbing detail in all of this because she was 18 at the time. Afterwards, the girl called the police and Herbert was charged with indecent assault and battery. He was also banned from the mall that he was playing Santa at and given a court order to not portray Santa for the rest of the Christmas holiday season. Herbert denied that all of this ever happened, but in an ironic twist, his court date was set for Christmas Eve. And I just think it's creepy that if he really did wish that the girl was younger, what was he thinking about the children that were sitting on his lap while he was playing Santa in that mall? 
The whole story just has really disturbing implications. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. So this Massachusetts woman will not face charges after four newborns were found frozen solid in a freezer inside of shoe boxes. The woman is 69 years old. They found these boxes about two years ago. Her name was Alexis Aldemir and the police department are saying this is the most complicated and convoluted case they've ever seen. So in November of 2022, a man called saying that him and his wife were cleaning out the freezer and they found these shoe boxes in there with babies. Now, apparently the umbilical cords were still attached. They were all frozen solid. The medical examiner said the cause of death is undetermined and they have no idea how long these babies have been inside of that freezer. There was also no indication of trauma or injury. There was no food in the digestive systems. And they also have no idea if the children were born alive or not. Apparently, DNA testing revealed all four children belong to Aldemir. Apparently, Aldemir and her man had five children together, one who they gave up for adoption. They believe many elements of this case can never be answered because Aldemir is not in the right mental status or health status to even stand trial. She was confused on who she was talking to, where she was, you know, all that stuff. Because of that, you literally cannot bring this person to trial. So even though the DNA is linked back to her and everything like that, we'll never know what happened truly. Let me know what you guys think about this case in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. The brother of Aaron Hernandez has been arrested for allegedly planning school shootings. Dennis Hernandez is known as DJ, and he is the older brother to the late NFL star Aaron Hernandez. Aaron was involved in crime during his lifetime and was convicted of first-degree murder in 2015. He was later charged with a double homicide but was acquitted, but was later found deceased in his cell. He had unalived himself in prison. Police state that DJ was allegedly planning school shootings at the University of Connecticut and Brown University. Several people reported that DJ was acting erratically. In their opinion, they said that he was disturbed and a danger to society. His ex-girlfriend reported that she was concerned for his mental health. She believed that he'd been mapping some schools out. He allegedly borrowed her car and used it to scout out several campuses. She claimed that he said he has a bullet for everyone. Police went to DJ's property on the 18th of July to try and arrest him and there was a standoff. Apparently DJ told police that if they tried to arrest him, he would try to kill them. He was tasered and placed in custody. A Pennsylvania couple is accused of killing a man that was found on the side of the road. The body of 44-year-old Daryl Lee was found on the 14th of July. His cause of death was a single gunshot wound. It's believed that Justin Green, who is pictured here, was working with Daryl at some landscaping jobs on the day he went missing. Justin initially told police that he'd simply given Daryl a lift home. However, CCTV from the area painted a different picture. Police believed that Justin and his girlfriend, Brooke Pullin, could be involved in the victim's death. Now, Brooke has multicolored hair and a multicolored hair was actually found on Daryl's body. The couple claimed that they went on a road trip on the evening in question. Two shotgun shells were found in Justin's vehicle. When the pair were arrested, they were found in possession of Daryl's bank card. Justin then told police that he had shot Daryl while driving. He said he then covered up Daryl's body with clothing and tools that were in the car. He claims that he then went and picked his girlfriend up from home. He said that even when she was in the car, she had no idea that a body was in the passenger seat. The pair are currently being held in custody. What would you do if you bumped into a man eating a murder victim's face? It was the 28th of April in the Las Vegas Art District. Police turned up to a horrifying scene after being called about a person tackling another person to the ground. Two men had allegedly got into a physical altercation. This was just after around half four in the morning. When police arrived, they discovered a male on the floor, unresponsive, with blood coming from his head. 31-year-old Colin Check was arrested by police and taken into custody after allegedly not only attacking said victim, but also eating the eyeball and ear of the man. Officers claimed that the accused had biological matter in his hair, mouth, and on his clothing. An hour after the incident, a member of the public had called police to report seeing a male eating another man's face at the bus stop. 
Now, Colin allegedly told officers that he'd been going in and out of consciousness after having been awake for five days straight. He claimed that something was possessing him. Colin was unable to appear in court, interestingly, after being hospitalized. He's been ordered to remain in custody once he is discharged and will be held without bail. These are videos humans were never meant to see. This video is a simulation of what happened to Alaska Flight 261 following a catastrophic loss of pitch control killing all 88 people on board. This is real audio footage from the plane going down between the pilots and air traffic control. Just listen to how calm the pilots are. The plane went inverted, meaning it was flying upside down. These are pictures with the most disturbing backstories, part one. This is Halianja Chub, also known as Miss Pac-Man. And on October 29th, 2018, she was brutally murdered in her own bed. Her husband took a machete to her head, completely mutilating her and dividing her face in two, hence the name Miss Pac-Man. But the most disturbing thing about this whole case is that the video of the murder is going viral on Reddit and other streaming services but I do not recommend watching it because it is absolutely gut-turning. You can see Halianja with her face cut in two and her body cut, with an unimaginable amount of blood around her. And the entire time she was crying out for help and the neighbors heard her, but nobody came to her aid until her husband Mario left. The neighbors then came over and they were the ones who actually took the video. Halianja was lying there in pain for 30 minutes, and this is the kind of pain you can never imagine. And the neighbors described her as just wailing for 30 minutes until she died. When her husband Mario fled, he did try to go to Mexico, but he was unsuccessful. The authorities did capture him and arrest him. And this sick man is still on trial for his crimes. And the most messed up part is, even though he confessed to what he did, he still tried to blame Alejandra and said it was all her fault. Believing she was having an affair, but that was never proven. I don't know if you ever heard about the island of the dolls. All I've heard about is that it's literally just an island by itself yeah. with a bunch of dolls. Well, have you heard about the legend behind it? I've never heard about it. In the 1950s, there was a man. His name was Julian Santana Barrera. He was a guy who loved peace and quiet. He didn't like being around people like that. So that's why he decided to live there. And then one day, his peace was interrupted by a girl that he heard in the canal drowning. In the panic, he tries to save the girl. But then when he tries to save the girl, he realizes that it's already too late. The girl is already dead a little bit after a doll appears in the same exact spot that the girl had drowned in as respect he ends up hanging up the doll on a tree but after that whole thing that same night he started hearing voices and screams of a little girl basically being tormented by these evil spirits that he said so what he decided to do was collect dolls no matter where he got them from if it was a garbage no matter how they looked and he would hang them on trees he put them around his little hut he believed that by doing this it would please the girl spirit and also keep away evil spirits and every single doll represents an evil spirit for the next 50 years he collected dolls and i'm not talking about a couple hundred dolls bro i'm talking about thousands of dolls but around i would say 2001 he ends up getting a heart attack but where his body was found was the exact same spot that the girl died in have people seen shit i'm gonna show you a clip because ghost adventures actually visited the island and Please be warned that this true crime case is horrific. This little girl was buried alive in her abuser's back garden. Jessica Lunsford was a nine-year-old girl living in Florida. It was night time on the 23rd of February 2005 and Jessica was sleeping in her room. S offender John Cooey snatched the little girl from her bedroom and took her back to his trailer. 
What followed were three days of horrific repeated essays from John to the little girl. He then decided to wrap the little girl's hands with speaker wire and place her in bin bags. He'd actually convinced her that he was going to take her home and he just needed to put her in the bin bags so as he didn't alarm anybody. He said he was afraid of being seen with her so if he put her in the bin bags it was like a disguise. He then buried her alive in his back garden. Heartbreakingly, she was found cuddling her little dolphin teddy that her dad had given to her. Again, I did warn you that this was a really horrible case, but when police found her body, they found that she'd actually tried to claw out of the bin bags. Frustratingly, when the girl had gone missing, police actually did go round to question John. It's believed that while this was going on, Jessica must have been alive inside of the property. Her blood and fingerprints were found inside his home and John was convicted of first degree murder. He died of natural causes in 2009. This man was sentenced to 108 years in prison for some of the most horrific crimes I've ever read about. On October 16th, 2019, police received a tip that child sex abuse materials were being posted online and shared on a big social media platform. And just a few hours later, Stephen Ryan Price was arrested for these crimes. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children actually went on to explain that these materials had never been seen on the internet before, so it was believed that the man who was uploading them was creating them as they went. And using the IP address reported by Discord, the police were led directly to Stephen. Stephen, a 27-year-old from Washuga, Washington, near Tacoma, admitted to doing this. And according to Stephen, in 2019, he was living with his spouse and an infant child in a motel in Washington. He then got out his smartphone when his spouse was gone. He proceeded to assault the infant child, recorded all of it, and then headed on to Discord and Skype to share the video of this sex assault to the internet. And in that same summer of 2019, he also recorded his sex assault of another infant, this time the child of an acquaintance that he met at the motel. But as soon as he started uploading these horrific videos that he had filmed up onto the internet, the police were involved. Like I said, just hours after the tip was received, Stephen was arrested and sent to jail. And in March of this year, he was sentenced to 108 years in prison. Stephen was convicted of five counts of first degree child assault, first degree molestation, four counts of the sexual exploitation of a minor, three counts of dealing CP, and four counts of possessing CP. So to Stephen, I say good riddance and have fun rotting. The disappearance of three-year-old Riker Webb is one of the strangest stories I've ever read. So this is Riker Webb, a three-year-old from small town Troy, Montana. And on June 5th, 2023, this is how he looked when he was found. On that day, a family that was visiting their remote cabin in the middle of the wilderness heard the sounds of a little boy crying out from behind a shed. When they went behind the shed, they discovered young three-year-old Riker. He was all alone, he was terrified, and they didn't know how he had gotten there. So they called the police, they located his family, and they figured out that he'd been missing for two nights. So apparently on the day that he went missing, Riker had been outside playing with his dog and he decided to go on a walk by himself. Now, according to some reports, his family actually noticed that he had been missing but waited for two hours to actually report it to the police. And in that time, Riker traveled a very long distance. Now, just take a look at this little map. This is where Riker was at the beginning of this ordeal, and this is where he was found two days later. I think it's absolutely wild. I think it's absolutely wild that a three-year-old could actually walk that far in two days let alone completely by themselves in an area that according to locals is heavily populated with bears and mountain lions. Now, during the time while Riker was missing, there were massive thunderstorms that were pummeling the area, water was pouring down from above, and at night the temperatures dropped into the 40s, so these were absolutely insane weather conditions. And even some adults wouldn't be able to survive this ordeal. So there are still so many questions that remain in my head about this case, like how he made his way all the way down from that point to that point, uh, how he survived the elements. But at the end of the day, I'm just so happy that he was found and located and brought home safely. This is the last photo ever taken of Jolie Kellen, just moments before she was murdered. Her ex-boyfriend and killer was behind the camera. In 2014, Jolie was a senior at high school and she began dating Loren Daniel Bunner, but he soon became extremely possessive and controlling. And just 10 months into the relationship, she ended things. Months went by and Jolie was actually in a new relationship when she received a message from Loren asking to meet up with him to chat about their relationship as friends. 
She agreed, but she jokingly texted a friend saying, if something happens to me, you'll know who I was with. On August 30th, 2015, Jolie took her dog and she went to meet Loren at a state park in the Alabama countryside. Chillingly, he chronicled their day on social media, posting multiple pictures like this of Jolie. I have no idea whether she knew that he was taking these pictures or not, but the last one he took was this one. She stood with her back to the camera. Just moments after taking this picture, Loren took out a gun and he shot Jolie in the back of the head. She collapsed to the ground. He walked over to her, shot her again in between the eyes and then pushed her body over the side of the cliff. He then calmly walked back to his car, called 911 and told the operator, I want to hand myself in for the murder of my ex-girlfriend Jolie Callan. It happened just moments ago. He then waited in his car for the police to arrive. Loren was found guilty of Jolie's murder and he was sentenced to 52 years in prison, although he is eligible for parole after just 15 years, when he'll be in his mid-30s. It's what baby reindeer didn't tell you. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few weeks, you will probably have heard of Baby Reindeer. It's a new series on Netflix which is a harrowing account of abuse and stalking. Now, it's told by the actual victim in this case, who plays himself. However, there are a few things that have been missed out. Now, Richard Gadd, as I said, was the victim in this case and told the story by playing himself. But Richard was actually a lot more successful than he gave himself credit for in the drama. He featured as an actor on Outlander and Click, and he also more recently co-wrote an episode of Sex Education. Obviously, we know Martha's real name and identity were left out of the series. Richard also intentionally changed elements of her character. He said that he wanted to change bits of her life, as well as obviously using a different name for her in the series, so that she wouldn't be hounded in real life. He actually wanted to prevent people from harassing the real stalker. Another element that was left out of the story were exactly how many messages his stalker left for him. Now, Richard has since stated that there were over 41,000 emails, 744 tweets, and 46 Facebook messages from four different Facebook accounts. He stated that the total length of all of the voicemails that the real Martha left for him totaled over 350 hours. She also sent him 106 pages of actual physical letters, which we never saw in the series. Richard stated that not only did his stalker send him emails, Facebook messages and tweets, she actually also sent him physical gifts. These gifts included an actual baby reindeer toy as a present and she also sent him sleeping tablets and boxes. This woman's boyfriend found CP images on her phone and the images were of his own daughter. So meet Ashley Cheatham. She's from Oklahoma and she was just arrested last week after her boyfriend went through her phone and found one of the most disturbing things you can imagine. So initially her boyfriend thought that Ashley might be cheating on him or doing something weird on the internet. So he decided to go through her phone and make sure she wasn't messaging other dudes. But when he went through her camera roll, he found disturbing graphic photos of his own daughter in compromising positions being abused by Ashley. Now, immediately Ashley's boyfriend went into the police department and he was basically begging for a police officer to talk to him immediately so that he could report this behavior to the authorities. And after hearing the story and seeing the evidence, authorities went in immediately to go arrest Ashley. And now she's been charged with a number of felonies, including the essay of a child under the age of 12, the making and distributing of obscene material or CP, and some other drug charges. But this story still gets more disturbing if that's even possible. So while authorities were doing a background check on her after her arrest, they found out that Ashley was in the process of applying to work at a local elementary school. And according to some reports, she actually was posting online looking for churches that needed volunteers or workers to help work with the children. So needless to say, I don't know and I I don't want to know exactly what she was planning, but this woman adamantly wanted access to children and she was determined to get that access. Sadly, her boyfriend's three-year-old daughter was the victim and hopefully the only victim that we're going to find out of Ashley's. But yeah, this once again just goes to show that you cannot trust anybody, really. I mean, she's only 19 years old and she's already engaged herself in the most despicable crime you can possibly commit. So good luck in prison. Have fun. We won't miss you, Ashley. 
This is one of the most high profile pedophiles in Hollywood, Mark Sailing from the TV show Glee. Now, you might remember Mark from the show Glee. He played Noah Puck Puckerman. He was a major recurring character on the show. He was always on the screen. And in the press, he was famous for dating his co-star, Naya Rivera, who also died a tragic death just a few years ago. And from the outside looking in, Mark appeared to be a very, very normal A-list Hollywood actor, but he wasn't. You see, Mark's legal trouble started in 2013 when his ex-girlfriend accused him of sexual battery. Apparently, he forced her to do it without protection and she filed charges against him. He ended up paying $2.7 million, but everything was dropped eventually. But then, in 2015, when Glee was at the height of its popularity, some more disturbing charges were brought against Mark. It was December 29th, 2015, when Mark was arrested at his Los Angeles area home and charged with the possession of CP or CSAM. Now, he was released on a $20,000 bail, but when investigators went through his home and searched all of his hard drives, they found over 50,000 CP images. Obviously, this is a lot more than they usually find on these busts. 50,000 images is a massive amount to be in possession of. And a few months later, he was publicly charged with possession of CP. He was dropped from the films and TV shows that he was appearing in at the time. And a year later, after his trial and everything, he was convicted of these charges. Now, he was set to be sentenced most likely to four to seven years in prison. But before he could actually be sent to prison, on January 30th, 2018, Mark Sailing took his own life by hanging himself in his Los Angeles area home. I always thought that this was a very disturbing ordeal because the show Glee is such a positive, happy show. And you would just never expect a main cast member from that production to actually be involved so deeply in such a disturbing world. There's also a lot to talk about when it comes to other cast members of the show and what's happened to them. So if you want me to do a shorter series on that, just let me know in the comments. This baby was kidnapped and then the parents received the wrong baby back. In April 1964, Dora Fronzak gave birth to baby Paul. Although this should have been one of the happiest days of her life, it soon escalated into a nightmare. Paul was kidnapped. A woman posed as a nurse and using her fake profession, she managed to steal Paul from the Chicago hospital. Word spread that the baby was missing and 600 homes were frantically searched. Paul's parents made devastating pleas for his return. Now, police only had Paul's ear shape and blood type to go off. However, they did soon find an abandoned child in New Jersey. When Dora saw him, she was incredibly relieved. She had baby Paul back and that would be the last of it for 10 years. One Christmas when he was hunting for presents, 10 year old Paul discovered a memory box and inside this box were news clippings from his kidnapping. When he confronted his mum about this, she shut the conversation down, but it stayed in the back of his mind. Paul started to have doubts about his true history. In 2012, he did a DNA test and the results shocked everyone. Paul was not the Paul who'd been kidnapped. He wasn't biologically related to either of his parents. Now, sadly, his parents were actually furious at Paul and they refused to speak to him for a year. In 2015, Paul discovered that he was actually born as Jack and he had a twin sister, Jill. His biological mum had a drinking problem and his dad was a violent man. Meanwhile, the FBI ended up reopening the case of missing baby Paul. It was actually another home DNA test that revealed where he was. A man named Kevin Beatty was actually missing baby Paul. Now, the woman who raised him had actually passed away, so some mystery still remains about missing baby Paul. Tragically, in 2019, Dora actually arranged to meet her long-lost son, Kevin. However, before the pair could reunite, Kevin actually died of cancer. Paul's twin sister, Jill, is still missing. He continues to look for her, and you could actually help solve this cold case. By taking home DNA tests and uploading your information onto jedmatch.com, we can all help to solve cold cases. This 17-year-old boy was buried alive and murdered, and this case is absolutely gut-turning. Jose Garrado was a 17-year-old boy who lived in Miami, Florida. He attended school at the U.S. Job Corp Center in a remote area of Miami. The school was surrounded by wooded area with small roads leading into the woods. The Job Corps is a program that provides vacational training and boarding to at-risk youths from the ages 16 to 24. Jose wanted to better himself and become a mechanic. On June 28, 2015, Jose asked the Job Corps staff if he was able to leave the campus to get some food. They said yes and Jose left, but Jose never returned. Hours went by with no word from him and days would pass and nobody would see him anywhere. On the third day of his disappearance, Jose's brother was desperately searching for him. He searched in the woods not too far from where the school was located. 
And in the woods, he was met with a sight no brother should ever see. He saw feet poking out of the ground in an area that seemed to be burned. He had found his brother dead, buried in the woods. Five suspects were arrested, Kahim Habello, who was 18, Desiree Strickland, who was 19, Jonathan Lucas, who was 18, Christian Cologne, who was 19, and Joseph Cabarrao, who was 20. These five people were known on campus for being boys. It's thought they had bullied Jose and also took his money. On June 28th, they had lured Jose into the woods with the intention of carrying out a truly horrific murder. The group led Jose to a pre-dug grave, a grave they had dug two weeks earlier with the intention of burying Jose there. And in a nearby bush, they had also hidden a machete. And once they were deep enough into the woods where the grave was, the gang ambushed Jose. Kahim grabbed the machete and viciously hit Jose with it over and over again. Jose tried his best to fight back, but he was just outnumbered and outstrength. The group then made him get into the pre-dug grave. Kahim then continued to hit Jose with the machete until his face was completely caved in. Jose fell into the grave from the attack and as he laid in it severely wounded, the group used a shovel to bury him and it's believed Jose was buried alive. Which is many people's worst nightmare. While the group was beating Jose, Desiree, who was pictured on the top, had gone behind a tree to urinate and missed a large part of the violence they were inflicting on Jose, and she was furious the group hacked Jose to death without her. Jonathan, Christian, and Joseph returned to campus after burning Jose's items and cleaning the crime scene, but Desiree and Kahim wanted to celebrate and weren't ready for it to be over just yet. The two stayed behind and had intercourse right next to where Jose's body was buried. Allegedly, Jose owed Kahim $200 and this is believed to be the motive for the murder. Kahim, Jonathan, and Christian confessed to the crime shortly after being arrested. This case is truly awful and the fact that they buried him alive after hacking him with a machete is extremely haunting and disturbing. There is honestly some awful people in this world and to murder someone over $200 will never make sense to me. Rest in peace to Jose, he truly did not deserve this at all. Sometimes true for strange and fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders, gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminating in acts of cannibalism. Tell me a ghost story that sounds completely unbelievable but is entirely true. I'll go first. I saw a shadow man wearing a hat in my bedroom and it tried to attack me. So, you guys probably have already seen my first stitch, but I lived in a haunted house. My parents built this house. This is back in 2013. There were no structures on the land before we moved on to the place. It was just like grass. And yeah, the first day we moved in, we had paranormal activity. This grew worse and worse. We had TVs turning on by themselves. We had people hearing screaming in the house. My whole family heard a baby cry. I heard something that I thought was my mom talking to me, but it got down on all fours and started crawling around my floor. And so much was just happening. but. So before we called the psychics to come in to cleanse the house, this is when this happened. So my bedroom's right here, right? My bed was on the back wall and there's a big window right here. And through the window you could see all these trees because there was a little bit of a forest area and then the neighbor's house through the woods. And there's a creepy story with the neighbor's house and how they died, but I can talk about that later. So this one night I wake up and it's the middle of the night and I feel just like really scared, you know, like a feeling of dread. And I'm looking around my room, and when my eyes kind of start to focus, I can see a shadow standing in the window. Now, the moon is like, I can see the moonlight shining through the window, so this shadow is really, really dark, and it's really black. And it's got, it's very tall, it's probably six, seven feet tall, and got a big, wide-brimmed hat on its head. So I'm tripping out, I don't know if I'm dreaming or what the hell's happening, but as I'm staring at this thing, I get this feeling of just like, dread and pure terror like this thing doesn't like me and it doesn't want me in here oh my god i get chills thinking and so as i'm staring at this thing keep in mind i can see it because there's moonlight coming through the window it starts moving towards me and it's not walking like it's not going like this like taking steps it's literally gliding towards me slowly and i oh my god so this thing's moving towards me and I'm completely frozen. I'm paralyzed. I literally couldn't move. I was thinking I need to do something. It's getting closer. I need to do something. But I physically couldn't move my body. Like, yeah, it's probably sleep paralysis or something like that. But it was like I couldn't move. But eventually as this thing got closer and closer and that feeling got worse and worse, it was like a foot from my bed. 
I was able to snap and I went and turned my lamp on because I had a little desk right next to my bed. Light came on, completely empty room. And so yeah, that was scary as shit. Um, and that actually was one of the incidents that was the impetus to us calling the psychics to the house because at that point, I was absolutely terrified. And I have a ghost hunting YouTube channel now because I've devoted my life to this after having all these experiences. But none of this was filmed, none of this was on camera. Um, this is all just stuff that happened to me and made me who I am today and kind of inspired me to do the work I do. But there's so many more stories from that house. There's the baby crying. There's the time my dad pulled out a weapon because he thought someone was chasing him around the house. There are the break-ins that happened that were done by a ghost. There's the whole story of the psychics, what they told us, the research my mom and I did when we went down to the courthouse to check out what was on the land before us. And even up till when we moved out of the house a few years ago, stuff was happening. So I'm going to make this a series. If you want to hear more of my haunted house stories, because there are plenty and they get, there's some that are even scarier that I'm holding back on right now, but make sure to follow me because I'm going to start that series um, this week. I'll just tell some campfire ghost stories that are true. This may sound crazy as shit, but this stuff is true and it does happen to people every single day. We need to talk about Noah Pesgrove and how he was mysteriously found dead on the side of a highway completely naked with horrific injuries. Yet nobody knows how he got there or what killed him. So this is 19 year old Noah Pesgrove. Over Labor Day weekend last year, he attended a four day house party in Terrell, Oklahoma with his friends. There was drinking involved and at some point in the night, Noah and a couple of his friends rode an ATV which ended up rolling over. They were all okay so they went back to the house party where Noah reportedly got into an argument with a girl. Later that night, Noah reportedly told a friend that he wanted to go on a walk but couldn't find one of his shoes. So he took his friend's shoe, put it on, and left. This would be the last time that anybody saw him alive. And this all happened on September 3rd. At around 6 the next morning, a state trooper who was making his rounds saw something on the side of the highway that made him stop. There on the side of Highway 81 was a body. The body turned out to be Noah and it was a horrifying scene. Noah was completely naked except for his shoes and one of them wasn't even his. He was curled up in the fetal position and blood was pooling around his his head. According to his autopsy, Noah had multiple broken ribs, several missing teeth, his skull was caved in, and chunks of his hair were gone. But here's where things get odd. Noah's missing teeth were found laying right next to him, and his white shorts were reportedly found strewn in the middle of the road. But when Noah's brother arrived at the scene that morning shortly after he was found, the shorts were folded up. According to his brother, Noah was covered with a sheet and he could see blood seeping through. Early on in the investigation, authorities deemed Noah's death as suspicious. He had no injuries, to the lower half of his body and there was really no evidence found at the scene that indicated that this was a hit and run. There weren't any tire marks on the road and there was no vehicle parts broken off anywhere. He was naked, yet both of his shoes were still on and his teeth were laying so close to him that it just doesn't seem like he was hit by a fast moving vehicle. And they would have been going fast because this was on the highway. Noah's family said that after viewing his body, he was severely bruised and swollen and his nose and cheek looked like it had been broken. According to the medical examiner, Noah died of multiple blunt force injuries, but they don't know what caused those injuries. And because of this, his manner of death was listed as unknown. The medical examiner doesn't even know exactly when he was injured. There were no drugs found in his system either. The Oklahoma State Bureau labeled his death as suspicious and has since interviewed multiple people that were at the house party the night Noah died. Authorities even collected data from the phones of the people who attended the party and have gone through Snapchats, videos, and texts from around the time that Noah died. But despite that, they still haven't been able to piece together a timeline of his last movements. Police allegedly told Noah's family that they had several suspects in mind, but nothing ever came of it. Even to the extent of Noah's injuries and the mystery surrounding his death, authorities have stated that they don't believe that he was murdered and they won't be investigating his death as a murder going forward. So many questions remain in this case, like how he ended up in that particular spot that night and why all of his clothing had been removed except for his shoes. One thing we do know is that whatever happened to Noah was really bad and it's left many wondering what really happened at the party that night. People that attended the party have reportedly told authorities different stories and it's caused rumors to start floating around the community. For whatever reason, there's reportedly a rumor going around that Noah's best friend Jack and Jack's dad had something to do with his death. Jack was at the party that night and one of the first people at the site where Noah was found that morning. He's reportedly told the media that he believes that whatever happened to Noah was an accident, but that he doesn't know why people are saying that he had anything to do with it. I do want to remind you that this is just a rumor and Jack has since passed a polygraph in connection to the case. Noah was described as a class clown, a talented athlete, and just a really loved person. His family just wants to know what 
happened to him, even if it was just an accident. There were so many people at the party that night that somebody had to have seen something. If you have any information about the suspicious death of Noah Pesgrove, please call the Southwest Regional Communication Center at 580-353-0783. This photo is of the Cincinnati Crawler. It was taken by a family who caught him in their home in 1974, but he escaped shortly afterwards. So in 1974, the Johnson family in Cincinnati noticed a couple weird things happening in their home. The 14-year-old daughter, Claire, would complain about seeing glowing eyes outside of her window at night. And then one night, the youngest son, Timmy, was laying in bed in the dark when he felt the family dog jump up onto his bed. But when he went to go pet it, it was not the dog. It was the crawler, who police still believe was responsible for the disappearance of four other boys in the area. Some believe that he was an escaped convict, while others actually believe that he was the victim of human experiments happening in the area that may have been conducted by the family's dad. Claire snapped this photo of him before he escaped, but he was never found since. Just imagine capturing this on your ring camera. It was 2018 and just outside of her condo in Phoenix, Arizona when Jessica Catania got an alert on her phone and saw this. According to her eventual statement, she immediately realizes she's in danger. She locks her bedroom door, she starts dialing 911, but that's when she heard it. So whoever this man was, he then pries open the living room window and pops out the screen. He's in the house. But this woman, Jessica, she's like incredibly resourceful in a stressful situation. She immediately grabbed a hammer, any weapon that she could find from her closet, and she hides in her bathroom. But while she's waiting in there, she's got the door locked, but it would only be about three minutes before she eventually hears police inside her condo. But the problem is, they never found the man. To this day, she has no idea who this man was or why he broke into her condo. In the investigation, police would eventually nickname him Smiles. What I'm about to show you is the photo Katrina Whaling captured on her ring camera the other night. So Katrina lives alone down a long country road in West Texas. And three nights ago, she invited a friend over for dinner at 7 p.m. But seven rolls around and her friend's not there. And then eight rolls around and her friend is still not there. And that's when Katrina starts to hear footsteps outside, slow at first, but then it starts to sound like someone is running full speed at her house. Thinking it's her friend, she goes to open the door, but no one is there. So Katrina calls her friend, but then when the other line picks up, it's just heavy breathing and then laughing. She's really freaked out now, so she runs upstairs, but that's when she gets the notification that someone is at her front door. And this was that someone. Katrina is still alive to tell the tale, but there's been an uptick in Reddit users complaining in West Texas of hearing someone outside and then answering the door to see no one is there. People who almost died. This is Morgan Jade. Blake was crossing the Chesapeake Bay Bridge at around 8.30 on Friday night when she spotted an 18-wheeler speeding towards her. The truck slammed into her 2007 Chrysler Sebring twice, crashing it into the bridge's concrete barrier, then knocking it onto the wall, where it teetered briefly before falling into the water 27 feet below. Blake told the Washington Post that she started to panic as water flowed into her car, but then became calm. She unbuckled her seatbelt and pushed herself out through the car's broken window. After swimming to the surface, she headed to one of the bridge's supports, where a boater found her and helped her until rescuers arrived. Actual photo of the bridge. Actual photo of the scene. Actual photo of the car. Normal looking photos that have a disturbing backstory. This is former NBA player Mark Jackson's basketball card. In the background are the Menendez brothers. They're sitting courtside shortly after killing their parents and just before getting arrested. The 17-year-old who took this photo told his family members that he planned to hike the stairway to heaven. He texted multiple pictures before his disappearance, and shortly after, the family noticed a man in this photo. While this photo may seem like an ordinary picture of footprints in the sand, they actually belong to a four-year-old little girl who shortly after this photo was taken, drowned in the ocean. The two brothers in this photo are at Sequoia National Park. This photo was taken moments before they were both struck by lightning and both shockingly survived. There was a tradition in Victorian England to take photos of dead people, often dressed in their best clothes, and pose as if they were taking a family portrait. If you look at this photo for long enough, you will notice something is a little off about one of the children. The man who took this photo of his wife scuba diving off the Australian coast also managed to take a photo of Tina Watson, who was drowned by her husband that day in 2003. This experiment turned this woman 
into a monster. During World War II, there was a rumor that the Germans were on the edge of developing super troops, which could be used in the war. This would cause other governments to also try to make super soldiers. But because the experiment was very dangerous, no one wanted to be a lab rat. However, Albert Western, one of the leading scientists, offered his daughter Abigail for the terrible experiment. When the experiment began, it went downhill fast. Her bone structure began to change rapidly, and her hair fell out. She went completely insane shortly after that. Her father still had some hope that the project would work, but it didn't. He could not take it, so he ended his own life. The other scientists tried to get rid of Abigail and tried to starve her in her cell, but she got out and attacked the guards. It is said that she escaped, and no one knows where she went, and that is how you guys heard of the night lady? This all started in Chihuahua, Mexico, 2009. Residents started noticing something really disturbing. You see, now some of the children in the area were going missing. I gotta grab some food for this one. Look at this beautiful roll. Mm. Now with all the children around the area going missing, people started reporting seeing a woman. They said she would climb on the rooftops <laughs> during the day, only to wait till night to sneak in through the window to snatch children. Police then sketched an image of what they believed to be the night lady. Only one child has been reported of actually escaping the night lady. You see, his parents had ran into the room and caught her just in time. She quickly then escaped and crawled out of the window. Wait, before I continue, let's say the night lady had taken you. Your third at has to come and save you. Who is it? Let me know who it is. Anyways, the kid that got away recounted waking up in the middle of the night and seeing the night lady standing over top of him just watching. Him. People have brushed this off as just one big hoax. And so after midnight, a teenage girl had captured this photo. This is supposedly the night lady. The urban legend goes that this college age girl lived in a dorm with her best friend. So there was this big party going on. She invited her roommate like, hey, there's this huge party going on. Her roommate was like, I'm not going. Like, I, I got too much I got to do. I need to study. I got to test tomorrow. Like, it's just not going to happen. So she kept trying to convince her. And then eventually she was just like, okay, I'm going to go to the party. I'll come back. I'll see you. We'll kick it, whatever, right? Yeah. And she goes out, has the time of her life, whatever, comes back home. It's really late. And all of the lights are off at the apartment. But when she gets there, the door is mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. She always locks them. Maybe she just forgot. She walks in, all the lights are off. She almost went to her room, but then she was like, nah, it's late. I'm going to just let her sleep. So she goes to bed, right? She wakes up the next morning. She didn't hear her roommate. And she was like, mm, like, that's weird. She said she had a test and she needed to study. So like, so she goes out, all of the lights are still off. Like everything looks exactly how it did last night, right? Okay, now she's starting to get creeped out, right? Yeah. So then she goes into her roommate's room. She doesn't see her and she sees blood everywhere. And written on the mirror in blood says, How can I help you? Uh, uh, this is, um, uh, my name is James. As you can see, the man is acting very strange and almost doesn't know how to answer his questions. When the homeowner asks who he is looking for, pay attention to the name he gives. <clears throat> uh, Sosa. Uh, Sammy? He first says Sosa, then he says Sammy, like Sammy Sosa the baseball player. It was likely the first name he could come up with on the spot for a fake friend he was looking for. The homeowner then threatens the man to leave. What's your name? James. And who are you looking for? No, a friend of mine. No friend of yours lives here, buddy. And I got a Glock over here ready for you. So if you don't get the f off my porch, I'm going to unload it on your face. Get the f off my porch. The reason why he was trying to get inside the house is unknown. No one knows what could have happened if the man would have let him inside. The homeowner handled the situation the correct way by talking to the man through the locked and closed door via the ring doorbell camera. And once he noticed the man's strange and suspicious behavior, he threatened him to leave. Most Jim. terrifying demonic activity ever caught on camera. Bobby, is that you? Bobby. I get it. I get it, man. You're just gonna stare at each other for like, what? You got me. I don't know what the fuck their problem is. I'm gonna keep doing this shit. I'm just gonna stare at him then. Fuck it, right? Yeah. Come on, get out of here. Come on. Go. 
Go, 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 go. Right, just go to your room. It's fine. I know, did you? You got me. Jim, you got me. You got me, man. You got me. Okay, it's good. And just stay in your room. necessarily saying that the dude who gave her those swords and these other pictures I'm about to show y'all is a result of cannibalism. But I sure as shit am, okay? This is a secondhand story, but I've kept it in my heart and soul since like 2013, 2014. I was in high school, right? Okay, this is a story. And my English teacher at the time, wonderful lady, don't remember her name, she was short, had blonde bob, wore cute clothes. Anyway, she told us a story about uh, when she was in college and her and her friends were at spring break in Florida, right? Uh, one of her friends ended up, you know, dancing with this guy, whatever, making out, and um, he was trying desperately to get her to come to his place. Like, he had tried on several different occasions that night to get him to to get her to go to his house but all of her friends including my teacher were like no no we literally have a flight in the morning like if you leave you're not going to make it back with us so she was like okay okay whatever and eventually she got him off her back she ended up developing the same kind of sores on her face went to the dermatologist and then was greeted with the police once the results came back they asked her to come to the station she did they were like hey uh by chance do you know anyone who eats human flesh or do you by chance she was like mm, definitely not that's weird and they were like oh okay so uh have you been in contact with anybody who might and she was like well the only person that has been on my face recently was this guy at a bar right so they gave him a description and uh they end up going through the security cameras of that bar find this guy and then they find his house they show up there this man has three different women in freezers in his basement in various reasons of decay and dismemberment because he has been eating them yes they walk among us so i have a scary story time that i highly don't recommend for you to play out in the open put your airpods in put your headphones whatever you have to do just don't have this playing because it is very dark and you may call upon something you may not want in your space the person who submitted this wishes to remain anonymous for the sake of the story we're going to call her nelly so this story took place about two years ago right at the peak of pandemic time right around that time nelly and her son would wake up with scratches all over them the scratches would always come in threes they would also hear knocking at night that also came in threes. You guys all know what the three means. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the D word mocking the Trinity. They then start hearing voices and footsteps coming from upstairs while they were downstairs home alone. The final straw was when Nellie's son told her there was a pain on the wall that was moving. So she decided to take it down. Only to turn around and find that same painting set in the middle of the room with her sweater balled right on top of it. At this point, she decided to get some professional help and reached out to some paranormal investigators. At first, they came to her home to interview her to make sure that she wasn't having a mental breakdown and also to try to debunk some of her claims. After they were assured that she was perfectly fine, they decided to set up an investigation and told her that they would be back within two days. In those two days from the time the investigators visited the home, the activity in the house amped up drastically. The morning that the investigators were set to arrive, Nellie decided to drop her son off at the babysitter's house. Now, anytime Nellie spent time at that house, she always had background noise playing because she was always afraid of what she may hear. Being that they were getting ready to leave, everything was off in the house. And as Nellie was upstairs just finishing up with getting ready, she hears a woman's voice talking to her son downstairs. She yells down to her son and asks him who he's talking to. 
when she clearly hears a woman's voice say, don't tell her. Immediately, Nellie ran downstairs and went to grab her son. Now, her son is normally a very calm and sweet boy, but the minute she picked him up and said it's time to go, he completely lost it and had the biggest tantrum of his life. She practically had to fight to get him into the car. His arms kept wailing. He kept trying to do everything in his power to prevent from leaving the house. Finally, Nellie had to set him down. The minute she set him down, he ran to the garden and picked up a flower. And in the creepiest voice possible, he said, we have some visitors coming. I have a gift for them. Nellie felt sick to her stomach. She picked him up and put him in the car. When they were about 30 seconds down the road, it was almost like he snapped out of a trance and he went back to his normal self. They both ended up going out to eat. When they were out, Nellie's son did not mention anything about what had just happened. But unfortunately, in the craziness of trying to get her son out, she realized she forgot her overnight bag, which meant that she would have to go back to the house. Now I'm gonna have to do a part two because TikTok took away my 10 minute long videos. So I'll post this right after this. And curtain number one is... Correct! <laughs> You don't remember what she looks like. We ran out of this house, ran for our lives, and this is the story time as to why we had to do that. So a lot of you guys know um, from watching my Instagram what's been going on, but if you don't know, my house is haunted, and I know that sounds crazy. If you don't believe in this stuff, that's totally fine. Um, I wouldn't come on and embarrass myself this much if... Um, stuff wasn't happening enough. I didn't genuinely believe that the house is haunted. So that's just a little disclaimer. I don't even know where to start with this, but I'll go back to when we moved in. Moved in, um, it always felt a little bit strange, but it's an old house, you know? We're like, you know, it's, it's an old house, fine. Um, but then like sounds and stuff started happening. We also have a dog and a cat, could have been them. And it absolutely wasn't. Um, and as time went on and on and on, stuff started happening more and more and more. Like just really subtle stuff. Like you would swear someone was walking around upstairs. You would you would swear there was someone in the room with you. Like just stuff like that. But anyway, I don't want to have to be making loads of parts, so I'm just gonna skip in a little bit. So we went on holiday for a week, about two, a week and a half ago. And when we came back, it's as if like it took over the house. That wasn't our house anymore. It was. That was not our house anymore. Um, and that's when stuff actually started to happen. And like we were adamant, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the dogs. I'm just gonna do a quick things that were happening. Um, flickering lights, um, knocking on windows and mirrors, stomping up the stairs right up to our bedroom door, um, muffled sounds in our ears. We would hear whistling in our ears, um, and all the rest. Um, so we decided to go to a clairvoyant to see could they sense anything and they did. Um, side note, when we moved into that house, there was not one mirror, not one mirror on the, on the wall. They were gone. But anyway, we went to a clairvoyant and he told us that there's something there that shouldn't be there. Um, and he told us what he was kind of doing and he was right. And he said, he's just messing with us. He doesn't want to hurt us, but if it came to it, he would throw us downstairs. And that was his exact words. And the most creepiest feeling in the house is at the top of that land. And I'm actually going to show you what it looks like. It's it's awful. But anyway, um, he told us whatever, and he told us to stay to the place. And we did. And I wish we didn't. It got so much worse. Um, and we ran, we ran, we left all the lights on. Um, I didn't even get to grab my dog. Um, but we also found out that this has happened before to previous people and the landlord knew. Come back for part two. This schoolboy stabbed his teacher to death in front of a classroom full of students. 61 year old Anne Maguire was a Spanish teacher teaching in Leeds. She'd actually worked at the school for 40 years and she was only five months off retirement. However, in April 2014, something absolutely horrific happened. One of her students was 15 year old Will Cornick. He'd always been described as a smart student who never really caused any trouble. Classmates regarded him as a polite student, but after he got diagnosed with diabetes, his personality seemed to change. 
In 2013, he tried to join the army, but because of his diagnosis, he was rejected. Being in the army had been his dream, so this was really upsetting for him. After failing to complete his Spanish homework, he was given detention by Anne. He also expressed a wish to her that he wanted to drop Spanish, but she wouldn't let him, which only angered him more. He began to develop a deep-rooted grudge against Anne. Shockingly, he reportedly messaged his friends on Facebook asking if one of them would kill her for him for £10. During one school day, halfway through his Spanish class, Will decided to get up and attack Anne with a knife. The classmates watched on in horror as he chased her out of the classroom. When there, another teacher heard her screams and tried to shield Anne from any more blows from him. Will then allegedly returned to his class and told his classmates how it was a shame that he hadn't killed her. However, Anne did actually pass away from her injuries. Will later admitted that he did plan also to kill two other teachers. One of them was actually pregnant at the time. He's been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years.